practice is looking at what's right here, what's already right here. Instead of trying to create something in the future, we just take apart what we've got right here. Look at the chin on the body right now. I know a lot of people will get disappointed when they first come here. They first chant they hear in English, this body of mine. They want something inspiring, something that will lift them up. And what do they get? This body of mine. And it doesn't say very nice things about the body either. But the question is, are they lies? Did the Buddha lie to us about the body? Go down the list. Is there anything in the, he says it's there in the body that's not in the body? And are any of those things clean? The question is, why do we focus on this? It's because we don't look at what's right here. We keep making things up. John Sawat one time said that this is one of the big problems in the mind is it's constantly dealing in make-believe. It's like little kids saying, okay, I'll be the doctor and you'll be the patient. And even though they know they're not the doctor and not the patient, then they play out those roles. And this from a very early time, we're taught to ignore things that are right in front of our noses. So the practice means, okay, turning around and looking at what's right in front of our nose. And the big thing is there's a huge amount of attachment to the body. The body takes up so much of the day, so much of our time, so much of our thoughts, so much of our energy. Just picking up, moving it around. I've been going through physical therapy exercises recently because of my back and realizing that just holding your body, there's a lot of energy that goes into that. Holding it properly. If you're not holding it properly, learning how to hold it properly is a major reorganization. In so many different areas where the body is such a huge amount of our time. And we tend to block it out of our awareness, this particular attachment. We want to hear about learning how to renounce the ego. Well, the big renunciation right here is learning how to renounce this attachment to the body. How do you live with the body without being a Possessed, obsessed by it, or possessed by it. That's the real trick. Because only then is there real time to focus in on the mind. So you take the body apart. Wherever you find that there's a sense of attachment, a sense of clinging, you learn how to think in ways that will pry that clinging loose. Start first with your own body, then go to other people's bodies. Some people think this is an unhealthy state of mind, but no, it's Everybody is the same. We all have the same parts. And beautiful people have this, quote, beautiful people, unquote, they have the same kind of livers and lungs that we have. And we're all equal in that area. And so we have to keep that in mind, just as a way of cutting through not only our attachment to their own body, but our attachment to lust, our belief that lust is a good thing. It's not so much that we're really attached to that other person's body, we're attached to our lust, and then being through it, the attachment to the lust, the color is our view of that other person's body. So this is where our real attachment is, it's right here in the mind, learning how to deal with our affection for our lust. And learn how to look at that take that apart. Again, that's something that's right in front of our eyes, and yet we don't see it. So this is why the practice involves just sitting down and looking at right, what's right here. You look at the body, look at the breath. Try to get your awareness focused on what's right here in the present moment, to see what's right here. So the Dharma is proclaiming itself day in, day out, and yet we're turning a blind eye to it. When we talk about ignorance, ignorance is not just a passive thing, it's sometimes it's an act of ignoring to focus on the things we want to see and deny the things we don't want to see. So we've got to learn how to look at what's actually right here. And this is a big problem, this attachment to this body of mind. And as long as that remains unexplored territory, there's not going to be much you're going to be able to see in your own mind. You've got to get through this one first. Then when you get to the insights into the mind, it's a similar sort of thing. People 
read the account of the Buddha's awakening, they'd like to hear about lights and all the phantasmagoria that you hear in other people's great religious experiences. But what does the Buddha talk about? Well, this is suffering, this is the cause of suffering, this is the cessation of suffering, this is the path. No lights, no background music, just something very simple. But notice how the way the Buddha talks about the insight that gets you there. There's one passage where he asks you, what do I teach? I teach this is suffering. That's the kind of insight we're looking for. Look at how that sentence is phrased. It's talking about something that's right in front of your nose. You just point to it. So that's the kind of discernment we're talking about here. It's not discernment that goes spinning off into great big constru constructions, but it's learning how to look at what's right here. This is suffering. This is cessation of suffering. This is the cause of suffering. You're looking at things directly. Now that requires that the mind be really quiet, and all the disturbances involved with the body be cleared away. So you can look simply at events in the mind as they're happening and point to it and say, okay, this is this and that's that. And when he talks about the five khandhas, okay, such is form, such is arising, such is passing away. Again, the such here, it's in this way. Again, it's a pointer word. That's something that you're watching, not something that you're theorizing about, but you're actually looking at it happening. Oh, this is this and that's that. This is what those words are referring to. You're seeing them directly right in front of your eyes, the eyes of the mind. And finally, as you watch this thing, you begin to realize that all the great things that you were attached to were constructed out of these simple little events. And there's not much to them, just arising, staying for a minute, passing away, arising, passing away. And you wonder, why did the mind want to play these games of make-believe based on this stuff that just arises and passes away. There's a real sense of disenchantment, sometimes revulsion, that you spent all that time on nothing. It's like going to a movie and realizing all you're watching is just lights flashing on the screen. There's nothing up there, and yet you can get excited about it, you can cry about it, you can laugh from it, get scared, whatever the movie is trying to create in you. But it's just lights flashing on the screen and sounds coming out those speakers, and that's all. And yet you create this experience out of it. You create this reality out of it. And it's kind of waking up to that fact, these states of becoming that you create this way, and a sense of real disenchantment with the whole process, a desire to get out. So you. If you see what's arising along with the suffering and say, oh, this is the cause of suffering, and you see it directly right there, then you let go. You don't have to tell yourself to let go. When you realize, okay, this is what that is, and this is what's causing all that suffering, drop it. And finally get to the point that there's no this or that, basically. And all the thises or thats that you can point to are, have passed away, what's remaining there. On coming out of that experience, is oh, there's this too. That's all it is. And hey, you don't say, hey, I discovered this, or I was able to attain that. It's there's not that kind of thought at all. It's just the realization that there is this, and there's no sense of anybody in there attaining it. It's just okay. There is this aspect of experience as well, and it's amazing. You listen to some people talk about their awakening experiences, and the big point of they're talking about is that the I did this and I attained that. And the Buddha said immediately, well, that's a sign that there's still something left to let go of. And the realization, oh, there's this as well. And that sense of great relief that comes over, comes along with it, because you realize it wasn't anything you did. It's something that's there on its own. But again, it's hard to imagine people getting all excited and buying a book on, there is this. But for the person who gets there, okay, it, it makes all the difference in the world. So again, we like, we like to hear about the wisdom, hear about all the 
great insights, but the insights are things that have to be seen right here, right now. And so you have to get your mind right here, right now, and looking at these things directly, and not turning your gaze away from anything that's there. And a lot of the stuff you're going to see is your own stupidity, your own make-believe, the games your mind played with itself. But if your mind is in a good, solid state of concentration, it's not, it's not deflected by those things. It just keeps looking in and looking in. Because as we said many times before, once the mind is in good concentration, there's a strong sense of well-being and a willingness to kind of look in deeper and really get to the root of what is all this going on right here? And all these big issues in life, what are they made of? Well, look at them directly as they arise, as they pass away immediately based on this solid state of concentration we're working on. So you can get the mind in a place where it really sees these things directly. It's, oh, this is this, and that's that. And that's where it all makes sense. And that's where the wonder and the, and the amazing quality of the Dharma is. It's not in the things you can read about in books, it's kind of groove on the insights. But it's the actual experience. Oh. And there's nothing, there's no comparison to that. So keep looking straight right here, okay? If you see your own defilements, fine. It's better than not seeing them, even though they may seem upsetting when you see it. Look at all this distraction in the mind. Most people have that distraction, but they don't see anything wrong with it. It's fine. That's what their life is all about. So when you start out to meditate and you see distraction, at least that's a step in the right direction. Look at all this distraction. And that realization gives you the impetus you need to do more work on it. Until you finally do get some mastery over the states of the mind so you can settle down. And then you're in a position to start seeing what's actually going on. That's where the, the marvel of the Dharma comes. So as the Buddha said, his duty was to point. This is the path, the duty of the Buddha is simply to point the way. If he said too much, it would get in the way. And John Mahabua talks about how John Mun used to talk about, you practice this and you practice that, and as soon as he'd get to some great realization, he'd bypass it and go on to the next step of how you get beyond that. He wouldn't dwell on the insights. And as John Mahabua finally figured out, it was because if you learn about the, too much about the insights beforehand, that would become another sanya, another game the mind would play with itself when it got to that stage. So meditation is a treasure hunt. They say there's something really good out there, and this is how you get go about searching for it. But they don't want to tell you too much about it, because we would always want to take the words as a substitute for the real thing, and there is no substitute. And when you get there, the words are just barely verbal. This is and that's. They're just pointers. What, what it's pointing to is the real thing. 